Ecclesiastes tells us that there is a time for everything. Some of y'all are turning to Ecclesiastes already and you're wrong. But there's a time for everything. And there's a time when we as a church need to focus our attention on trying to understand what God is doing in the world today. Trying to understand the world from God's perspective. Because it's a different world than most of us grew up in, right? And that's what we were doing in our previous series called Counterfeits. Uh, but one of the consequences of spending so much time digging around in the mud of the world is that you start to get dirty, you know? And I think it's necessary for God's people to understand the perversions and the filth of this world, how people have taken God's good orderliness of things and flipped it around so that wrong seems right and right seems wrong. Uh, we all have to understand these things because even though we are not of the world, we live in the world, don't we? And it's the people, the people that are caught up in the filth of this world that Christ came to save. And so we must not abandon ourselves from the world and hide in our monasteries, hoping somehow that's going to keep us clean, because it won't. Even in the loneliest monastery on the remotest mountaintop of the world, we would still have to deal with the perversities of our own human hearts, which are wicked beyond measure. What we can do, however, is recognize that there is a time to focus our understanding on the world and its unending changes, and there is also a time when we must place our focus on the glory that is Christ. And that is what God would have us do today. It's time for us to swing the pendulum the other way. And we're going to do that by taking a journey through the book of Colossians. Now, the book of Colossians is a wonderful book of the Bible. The book of Colossians is uplifting. The book of Colossians is very positive. The book of Colossians is very encouraging. Uh, but most importantly, the book of Colossians lifts up the name and the work of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And so Colossians shows us how Jesus Christ is sufficient for our every need and that there is no need to seek spiritual truth or fulfillment elsewhere. In fact, Christ is not only, I mean, he, Christ is so sufficient, He not only fills us up, Christ overflows through us. And that is the name of our journey through the book of Colossians, Christ overflowing. And so from the very outset of the book of Colossians, we are encouraged. The words are so encouraging, the words are so positive, even from the very outset, that I knew that for this first eight verses that we're going to cover today in chapter one, I needed to somehow capture what these eight verses really meant. Uh, what they were saying to us, and I think I may have done it. I think the message from God to us is simply this. I love who you are. I want you to think about that. God says to us, I love who you are. Wouldn't it be nice if every day somebody said to you, I love who you are. Ladies, put your elbows away from your husband. That's not nice right now. <laughs> I love who you are. And I want to tell you something. If you are a follower of Christ, that is exactly how God sees you. God says to you, follower of Christ, I love who you are. If you have access to a Bible, I would invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. You're invited to follow along in your translation. The verses will also appear on the screen behind me. And since we, through this journey, will be going on a verse-by-verse -verse trek through this book of the Bible, we're going to have time each Sunday to 
when we do nothing but read that passage that we're going to make some comments on. And we're going to read these verses all the way through, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak to us uninterrupted by my comments. And so I believe it's appropriate for us, if you would not mind standing in honor of the reading of the Word of God, let's stand together as I read aloud Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints in Christ at Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. You have already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. It is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. You learn this from Epaphras, our dearly loved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has told us about your love in the Spirit. Father in heaven, I pray that you would allow your Holy Spirit to illumine your word to us so that we could interact with it and interact with you and be changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, the very first thing you ought to know about this book is that, as you might have already guessed, it was originally a letter. It was a letter from a guy named Paul and his associate to a church in Colossae. Where in the world is Colossae? Colossae is in modern-day Turkey, okay? And so uh, Paul and his associate Timothy were writing this book, and, and here's what Paul would do. Paul would sometimes take these missionary trips, these little journeys, and they weren't li really little journeys, they were long journeys, all throughout southern Europe, and he, everywhere he would go, he would tell people about Jesus, and he would start churches. And so this was his, his pattern. He would start churches, stay for a while, raise up some leaders, and then move to another place and do the same over and over and over again. And this, is consider, this took up a considerable amount of his life. And so one of the things you ought to know about this church at Colossae is Paul didn't start it. Paul didn't start this church at Colossae. In fact, when Paul wrote this letter, he, he, had, he was arrested. He was under house arrest, probably in Rome, when he wrote this letter. And so here's the picture. Paul is in Italy, you know, the country with the big boot. Paul's there, and the church is in modern-day Turkey, in Colossae. And the bunch of people that Paul is writing to, Paul doesn't even know them. He might know a few, but he doesn't know most of them. And so... How is he going to instruct these people that have never met him? What do you do? Well, the first thing you do is you need to establish your credentials. And so what Paul says at the very beginning, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. He's laying it out from the very beginning that if you're going to argue with what he has to say in this letter, you're really arguing with God. It was God who made him an apostle of Christ Jesus. And so what Paul writes to the, excuse me, to the Colossian church, God is also saying to us. And so what God has to say to us in this letter, we better listen to. This is not just a bunch of opinions from Paul that we can disagree with. These, this is not an editorial that's up for debate. This carries the authority of Christ Jesus and God himself. And so in verse 1, Paul, as we said, mentions his associate Timothy. Now, who's this Timothy guy? Timothy is probably Paul's number one associate. All throughout uh, Paul's letters, he mentions different associates and partners in ministry that he had. But he mentions no one more than Timothy. Timothy is a loyal man a trusted friend, a good friend, a fellow servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, Paul values Timothy very much. So this letter's coming from them. And who's he writing to? We've already covered that as well. Paul is writing to the Colossian uh, Christians. But look what he calls them. He says, to the saints in Christ at Colossae. What are saints? Saints. 
Well, there are some churches that teach that uh, dead believers who've been honored and glorified enough somehow turn into saints. You know, and sometimes we hear about St. Peter and St. Paul, or my favorite, St. Nicholas. <laughs> Which, by the way, Nicholas really was a Christian, but he never achieved any kind of sainthood in the Roman Catholic Church. But we call him a St. Nicholas because he was so giving, all right? So we think that these dead believers that have gone before us are somehow, they achieved sainthood by de declaration of the church, but that's not what Paul is talking about. He's not writing to a bunch of dead people. He's writing to a bunch of alive people. And he's writing to all of the followers of Christ. The implication is this. All of you are saints. What does that mean to be a saint? Here's what it means. It means that here's a whole group of people right here. Okay? And God has taken you and he has set you apart from the others. That's what it means to be a saint. You're set apart. You're not like the others. You live for God. The others live for self. You seek to be a, a holy man or a holy woman. The others have lives marked by unholiness and impurity. God has set you apart, and he has set you apart for a special purpose. Every one of us, beyond the very fact that God has called us out, he set us apart to be Christians, God has also set us apart in such a way that he's given each one of us a ministry. God has something he wants every one of us to do. And you might wonder, well, Pastor, what is it that God wants me to do? Well, I'll tell you what it is. I don't know. <laughs> well, Pastor, didn't they teach you at seminary that preachers should never say, I don't know? Yeah, they did. But sometimes I don't listen. The reality is, I cannot tell you what God is calling you to do. You've got to figure that out on your own. I know what God is calling me to do. In fact, I'm doing it right now. What has God called you to do? I don't know. You need to work that out with Him and ask Him. Don't ask me. It is, as they say, above my pay grade. I simply don't know. But I'll give you a couple of parameters. I do know this. That if you're a follower of Christ, the Holy Spirit has given you a ministry. And that ministry is either within the church, meaning, I don't mean within the four, build, four walls of this building, perhaps so. But when I say within the church, I mean your ministry is to minister to other believers. Or sometimes the ministry that God gives us is for you to minister to the people in your oikos. Greek word for sphere of influence. The people in your world, meaning that God wants you to be a Christian little league coach. God wants you to be a Christian businessman. God wants you to be a Christ Christian teacher. He wants you to be an emissary, an ambassador for him as a student in the schools. God wants you to be on mission for him wherever your world leads you. God has something Unique, that is just all your own. And I, I believe this, that if you seek after God with all of your heart, and you are willing to serve Him, He will show you what your ministry is. You have to be willing to serve. If your attitude is this, okay, God, show me what you want me to do, and then I'll decide whether to do it or not. No, you've got it all backwards. Because that attitude puts you in the driver's seat. And God will not take a back seat to anyone. Okay? That is not the order of things in God's kingdom. He is in charge. He tells us what to do. It is our responsibility 
to say to the Lord, yes, I will do whatever you ask me to do. Now, what is it? That is the proper attitude. And so moving on, we see at the end of verses 1 and 2, a little phrase here. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. Let's talk about grace and peace for a minute. Grace is this. It's undeserved favor that God gives to those who are in Christ. Undeserved favor that God gives to those who are in Christ. That's what grace is. God smiles upon you even though you don't deserve it. You hear people say, God, give me what I deserve. Ooh, don't pray that. Because the truth be known on God's standards, what you deserve would not be pleasant for you to receive. Okay? And so grace is your undeserved, the undeserved favor that God grants you because you are in Christ. And then peace. Peace is that beautiful word that has its roots in the Hebrew language, shalom. Peace is wholeness. It's rest that comes from having a right relationship with God and Christ. You see, when you are in Christ, and we're going to talk about what that means in a minute. When you are in Christ, that means that you are the recipient of God's grace. And that means that God grants you His grace peace. There's a peace in here. Even when things are going bad, there's a peace because God is with you. So how do you get in? How do you get God's grace? How do you get God's peace? You have to be in Christ. What that means is this, that you have to receive Jesus as Lord over all. That has to be a reality in your life. That you acknowledge and submit to Jesus as Lord over all. Some people think Jesus is fire insurance. They think that Jesus is a get out of hell free card. But Jesus is more than just a savior from hell. He is Lord over all. And you cannot split up Jesus into the parts of him that you want and reject the parts of him that you don't want. I would like to hope that nobody in this room ever thought that they came to Jesus and had an attitude that said, Jesus, I want you to save me from hell, but I have no intention of doing what you say. I am my own Lord. If that was your attitude when you came to Jesus and you've been wondering why this Jesus thing hasn't worked out for you so far, it's probably because you never truly came to Jesus in the first place. You might want to consider addressing that between you and God. I am not saying this. Please hear me and understand this very clearly. I'm not saying that you have to get your life right before you come to Jesus, because that ain't going to happen. I am not saying that once you come to Jesus, you will never sin again, because that ain't going to happen either. What I am saying is that when you come to Jesus, you will see that he is real, and you will see him for who he really is. He is your Savior and Lord over all. You go back to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you, you skim through those, read those sometime, and look at the type of people that came to faith in Jesus Christ. Okay? The people that came to faith in Christ, they were not the proud. They were not the self-righteous. They were broken. They were humble. They were truly contrite. They were repentant. They were dirty, rotten, no good sinners, just like you. That is the type of person that Jesus saves. He saves those who can't save themselves. And so they reach out to Jesus in mercy. And Jesus will always respond. 
Now, I told you earlier that when Paul was writing this letter, he didn't know many of the recipients, and so he had to establish his credentials. Well, there's something else that Paul needs to do if he wants them to swallow what he has to say. He needs to compliment them. Have you ever noticed how a kind compliment can open up someone else's heart to what you have to say? Of course, given the depths of your wisdom and understanding, I'm sure this would not escape your notice. I did just what Paul was saying. Anyway, some of y'all will get that later. A few weeks ago, I had the honor of being on an ordination council for a young man in Slayton, Texas. There's no truth to the rumor that I went to Slayton, Texas, also for its bakery. <laughs> I did, however, after the ordination council was complete, stop by the bakery, and it was a delicious decision to do so. But there were some other men there at the ordination council, some men you might have heard of, but one of them was Dr. D.L. Lowry. Now, Dr. Lowry is a very godly leader of Baptist in West Texas for many years. In fact, Dr. Lowry has been in ministry longer than I've been alive. And when Dr. Lowry, sitting in the council, called for nominations as to who should be the chairman of the ordination council, I spoke up and said, well, if the young man before us today is blessed with a ministry as long and fruitful as Dr. Lowry's, I could think of no greater honor than for our candidate today to, ha to have Dr. Lowry as the chairman of his ordination council. Yeah, to which Dr. Lowry rightly observed, Dr. Rhodes' compliments are actually Dr. Rhodes blowing smoke. But in spite of his protestations, Dr. Lowry was named chairman of the ordination council. You see, a good compliment can open up people's hearts. And that's what Paul does in verses 3 through the first part of verse 5. He says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. I think what Paul said of the Colossian Christians could rightly be said of you here in this room today. And I will tell you that when I pray for you, I thank God for you. And I am not blowing smoke. Okay? A few weeks ago, Dr. Jerry Joplin and his wife Carla came and visited our worship service. And Jerry pulled me aside and he said, David... Carla and I attend a lot of different churches, and I want you to know that I am not just saying this to be kind. He said, Broadview is just about the friendliest church we've ever visited. And Carla agreed. And I said, well, that's good to hear. And then he continued. He said, I mean it. He said, so many people in church think they're being friendly, but they're only being friendly to the people they already know. The people here welcome guests, too. I want you to know how grateful I am for that one thing. But there are so many other ways that I'm thankful for you as well, and I can't say it any better than Paul does. He says, we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. And of the love you have for all the saints because of the hope reserved for you in heaven. There's three big words that I just read. Faith, love, and hope. There's about four other times in the New Testament that these three words are coupled together. And we've already spoken of two very powerful words, grace and peace. But let's talk about these next three. Faith, hope, and love. Faith in Christ is how you relate to God. And Paul uses that term, faith in Christ. It's not faith in a higher being. It's not faith in some supreme being who's unnamed. It's not faith in just something larger than you out there. No, 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 no. 
It is faith in Christ. That is how you relate to God. And this is a clue to a major theme in the book of Colossians. The sufficiency of Christ Jesus. And Paul makes this much more clear later. But there are many people in Colossians, or excuse me, in the city of Colossae, who had committed a grave error. They were looking for spiritual truths and fulfillment apart from Christ. And this is one of the schemes of groups like the Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormons, groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses, and other groups which claim to either be Christian in nature or compatible with Christianity. But in the reality, they begin from the very beginning to push other teachings upon newcomers. And according to groups like these, you need Jesus and something else or someone else. You need the Bible plus other readings, other sources of authority. And so they begin to mix false teachings with truth. And by doing this, they deceive many people, including Christians. What was happening in the town of Colossae was this. You had groups that were called Gnostics, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S, Gnostics. And they said, we have secret knowledge. We have secret knowledge that you don't have. Come be a part of us, and we'll let you in on our secrets. And then they would add things to the Scriptures that were not there, diminishing the uniqueness of the Scriptures. They would add names to God that He does not reveal of himself in the scriptures, thus diminishing the glory of God. They would add personages of worship that claim to be on par with Christ, thus diminishing the sufficiency of Christ. They would add commands to obey that Jesus expressly forbids, thus diminishing the lordship of Christ. And they would add multiple ways that anyone could come to God the Father, thus diminishing the idea that salvation is found only through faith in Christ. And as we journey through this letter, Paul will remind us time and time again that Christ is sufficient for you. You do not need to yoke yourselves with those modern-day Gnostics by another name whose actions and words imply that Christ is insufficient. In the end... Christ is either sufficient or he's not. It's one or the other. So choose ye this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It is Jesus Christ and him alone who is sufficient for me. Faith in Christ is how you relate to God. There is no other way. And then you have another word, love. The word love here in Colossians is the word agape. We've become quite familiar with that word. Agape love is never-ending love. Agape love is patient love. It's the love that forgives. It's the love that is pure. Agape love is God's love for us. But you know something? Until the New Testament came along, hardly anybody in that day, way back when, ever talked about agape love. Why? They had no idea of what it was. They had no body who embodied it. Until Jesus came along and until his followers began embodying agape love, people literally didn't know what it was. They knew what eros love was, sexual love. They knew what phileo love was, that's brotherly love. But they didn't know what agape love was. Not until Christians started living it out. Agape love is that beautiful, forgiving, patient, and pure love of God. And then finally, you have hope. Hope is how you relate to the future. How do you relate to God? How do you relate to other believers? How do you relate to the future? You relate to God through faith in Christ. You relate to other believers by loving one another, agape and you relate to the future 
through hope. So what is it in the future that we hope for? What is it that God has in store for us in the future? Here is the object of our hope, that we will be made like Christ through the resurrection from the dead. That was the specific hope of believers in the New Testament. A lot of us think, well, you know, when I die, I'm going to go be this disembodied spirit up in heaven and sort of be with the Lord. And I'm not saying that won't happen because I believe it will. But that's not our hope. According to the New Testament, our hope goes beyond that. Our hope is when the trumpet sounds and when our bodies come up out of the cemetery with the new glorified body that cannot get sick, that cannot grow old, a glorified body that is like Christ's. And we live and reign with Christ forever. That is specifically, is our hope. And Paul continues with the people of Colossian in verse 5. He says, You've already heard about this hope. In the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you, it, the gospel, is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. The gospel, what does that mean? It's the good news. The good news about Christ and Him alone being sufficient for our salvation, that good news has come to us. The gospel has given us this hope about the resurrection from the dead. And the gospel is not just for us. Paul says this gospel has gone all over the world, and even more so in our day than it was in his. You see, the gospel is for everyone. The good news of Jesus It's for Africans and Asians and Europeans and South and North Americans. The good news of Jesus is for poor people and rich people and everyone in between. The good news of Jesus is for bikers and bankers and banana bread makers. The good news of Jesus is for all of us. It does not matter who you are. It does not matter where you've come from. It does not matter what side of the tracks you were born on. It does not matter what you've done in your life. So many people think, well, I've disqualified myself from heaven. I've disqualified myself from God's love because I did this bad thing. I did this other thing over here. I'm so ashamed of myself. I can't forgive myself. Listen to me. It does not matter what you've done. If you come to the Lord Jesus Christ today and say, I believe in you, Lord, he will forgive you. You will have a relationship with God forever and ever. The good news of Jesus is for you. And the good news has been bearing fruit all over the world. All over the world. Sometimes we can't see in our country the way the good news of the gospel is bearing fruit. But just because we can't see it so much in our country, don't don't think that it's not happening. In China and in India today, there are hundreds of millions of believers that meet in homes. And they worship the Lord Jesus Christ each and every week. And in Colossae, ever since the gospel had been taken to them, it was bearing fruit. And who was the one who took it to them? It was a guy by the name of Epaphras. Look at verses 7 and 8. Paul says, you learned this from Epaphras, our dearly loved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has told us about your love in the Spirit. Here's another one of Paul's partners in ministry, Epaphras. And Epaphras was able to go where Paul couldn't go. Why? Because Paul was arrested. He was in chains. So Epaphras was there. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the same no matter who shares it. And it bears fruit because the Spirit of God empowers it. I want to ask you a final question today. When you look at yourself in the mirror, do you love who you are? God does. God loves who you are. And why wouldn't he, Christian? Why wouldn't he love you? God has given you 
his undeserved favor in the form of grace. God has given you his wholeness and rest in the form of peace. God has given you a right relationship with him through faith. God has given you brothers and sisters in Christ who love you. And God has given you the promise of a certain resurrection through hope. Today, if you have not yet experienced what it means to be in Christ, you can. How can I be in Christ? Listen very carefully. You have to understand that Jesus Christ is Lord over all. He's not just another religious ruler. He wasn't just a good man way back then. No, no. He is the second person of the Godhead. And he is Lord over all. You have to understand that Jesus died on a cross to pay for your sins. And he rose from the grave so that you could have eternal life. So that you could be made right before God. And if you understand these things, then you need to trust in him and confess him as Lord. And God will do something with you in the spiritual realm. He will take you from one kingdom, the kingdom of sin and death and darkness, and in the spiritual realm, he will transfer you into another kingdom called Christ. And you will be in Christ for all eternity what do you have to do just say yes just come to him he will receive you 